Welcome to Services Marketing and Chapter 6. In this chapter, we're bringing about the discussion of price and looking at the role that pricing plays in services marketing, not just for its ability to raise some money and be the revenue, but also the roles that it can play as a communications tool, as a distribution option, and a capacity management function. Now, in this chapter, there are a lot of economic models, there's a lot of uh, dollar signs, and there's a lot of calculations. So you're reading the chapter, and you're going to read the chapter several times. The critical thing is that what I want you to do when you're reading a chapter is not disengage when you see the numbers and you see the equations. It's always easy to go, ah, oh, it's an equation, I'll step back, I'll switch my brain off, I'll skim past. But you don't want to do that. You want to really be on top of your game, connected and engaged with the ideas as they happen. So, what are we looking at for this section? Top of the list is, remember, we're the ones who make the money. Critical thing to understand about the whole way business is set up is if you're not selling something, providing some form of service, creating some revenue stream, you don't get to continue being a business. So for all the rubbish that gets talked about marketing by other disciplines, accountants don't bring in the money, they count the money. The lawyers don't bring in the money, they cost the money. Marketing brings in the money. So we've got to do the job well, but we've also got to hold our heads up with pride and basically know that we can hold the rest of the company and say, look, either you help us or there's going to be a different business here tomorrow because without us, there is no company. So the pricing objectives... Basically, we're talking about a giant table here. Table 6.1 goes for a bit, but basically what you're looking at here is a modification of some existing theory that you would have covered in the intro, and you've probably seen in economics. Basically, the first and foremost, the idea behind marketing and pricing is covering your cost and or seeking a profit. Now, what needs to be understood is that profit is not a bad thing inherently. Profit is the reason why we are going to be able to do the job again tomorrow. So what you need to consider in a marketing perspective and from a marketer sense is that if you are operating an organization and a firm and you're not making a profit, then you are not solving the problem that the market has. You're not creating an offering that has value because you're not going to be able to do this for the long term. So profitability is here to ensure that you survive and have a long-term ability to meet the needs of the market. At the same time, if you are operating in a manner that doesn't meet the needs of the market, and the market's not interested, then not making a profit and not covering your costs is nature's way of saying you've got the wrong product. So you first, Pricing objectives, revenue and profit objectives. Second area is to look at the patronage and user base. This is where you're looking at a set of uh, capacity based pricing. So you try to do things like build demand. And this is where you'll see last minute ticket sales, where you'll see discounts, you'll see the use of uh, trying to Establish capacity usage, especially where a full house, a sold out, a capacity crowd has a particular advantage and that it creates an atmosphere, it creates a dynamic. Also, where we're looking at the ability to modify price to modify demand. So you want to have, you've got capacity because you've got, say, a physical location, and you want to have the location in use. You have peak periods and you have off-peak, so you modify your pricing to drive demand to the off-peak period, so you're getting maximization of capacity. 
Third up is the non-monetary pricing objectives. And these have a whole series of their own components, ideas of fairness and equity, of affordability, of cross-subsidization. There's also one other aspect we haven't talked about here in that cost element is the perception of value. So pricing so that people feel that they are getting good value or pricing so that people feel that they're getting excellent service. So value can be in this sense the I am receiving more for the money I'm paying or I am receiving quality to the level that I would expect for the investment that I've outlaid. So that's the psychological elements. And this is one of the things that throughout this chapter we're going to be splitting between psychological and financial price. Look, I'll be honest, I put this diagram in because it's just a hat tip to the authors for managing to figure out how to get a chair into the diagram. The game is on now to find where is the bear and where are the people with games. So your pricing strategy, three legs, costs, competition, and value. So let's kick it off with the discussion of cost. This is a big one, and this is a difficult one. Because cost is an area that as service providers, as individuals, and particularly when you go on to be a professional, if you are talking here as a consultant, as a musician, as an artist, you'll want to discard costs as not proper costs. So you know that you need to pay yourself an hourly wage. You're working from home, so you calculate your hourly wage and then you look around and go, but you know, I'd have to pay the rent for living here anyway, so the on cost of the rent probably don't really count. Well, yes, they do. They're a cost. So you have to use all of the costs, not just the costs that you regard as the okay ones. Or you know, If you're outlaying money on it in the development of the service, and this includes product prototyping, this includes the product development costs, research and development, keeping the lawyers in check, the cost of actually owning a business and running a business, re-registration, tax, you need to be cognizant of all of the costs that are occurring and then you need to ensure that whatever price you set actually covers those costs and that the product and service you're offering is sufficiently valued and valuable to the customer that they're willing to pay that price. An important strategic consideration here is that you may find that when you tally up all of the costs and look at the price that the market's prepared to accept, you can't offer this product. In which case, walk away. Don't go, oh, look, I'll offer the product and you know, there'll be an economy of scale later. Walk away. If you calculate that you can't actually support yourself on this product at the price that's being offered in the market, that the market will bear, then you can't support yourself. So you've got to walk away from it. You don't want a winner's curse. You don't want to bid and acquire and lose money per transaction. You don't want to have a high customer base that costs you dollars every time you actually sell a product and service a market. And that's possible and feasible and happens way too often, which is why we keep seeing stories about restaurants that are $90,000 in debt when they close, restaurants that owe hundreds of thousands of dollars in rent and back pay, because they operated below cost. They didn't factor in all of their costs. They didn't factor in the cost of the restaurant will be open one night, nobody will come to the restaurant, so all the food, all of the operating costs, all there'll be no revenue that night, so all the other knights had to pick up the slack for that revenue loss. So you've got to be really thinking about this. All right, second leg of the uh, pricing is value. And value here is what is it worth to someone else? Not what does it cost, but what is it worth to the person who's going to buy this to your target market. Again, this is why market segmentation and targeting is so critical. 
the marketing definition, an offering that has value to customer, to client, to partner, to society at large. A rough calculation of value, the perceived benefits minus the assumed costs. The important thing to understand here is that this is in the mind of the customer. Perceived benefit is what they think they're going to get out of using your service, minus what they think it's going to cost them to use the service. Time, effort, money, those are factors, psychological factors, and quite often the psychological factors are higher than the financial price. But in terms of the types of value, what you need to be doing as a marketer is you need to be looking at your audience going, what is the offering I can present and what type of value are you seeking? Do you want it to be functional? It does what we want it to do. You walk into a dentist with damaged teeth, you walk out of a dentist with repaired teeth. Does it do what it says on the label? Does it do what we want it to do? Hedonic value. Is it going to be a great experience? And this is where if you look at something like the Tough Mudder cross-country run. Functional value. Will it do what we want it to do? Injurious, cover us in mud and make us feel cold and miserable? But what's the hedonic value of it? What does it the experience? And also, what's the symbolic value then of, look at me, I'm hardcore, I've run this race. Symbolic value is really an important facet of services. More so than you would imagine coming from a goods background, because services have that credence product, that credence, I can't judge the value of this service. But also, other people can't judge the value of the service. It's not easy to quickly assess. So the symbolisms, the symbolism and the messaging we can associate with the service can become a really powerful feature and a powerful value add-on that we can create, communicate, and deliver. And if we deliver this to people other than the customer, then the customer gets to have that symbolic value of, well, I travel, you, know, you travel first class, you've got to be rich. You travel business class, you've got to be important. The last part of value is the notion of value of the cost is cheaper. So the cheaper is better and cheaper as better. The less we've paid for it, the more we feel good about ourselves as savvy shoppers, smart people. So there is a symbolism element of cheap is powerful and there's a symbolic value of what does this service say about us insofar as the fact we were customers? Now, if we bring up the cost of the customer, and this is one of the things we're talking about here, is that the value is, no, the value is that statement of the perceived benefits, and we talked about the four different types of perceived benefits, minus the assumed costs. And the total customer cost concept here is more than money. So we need to talk about finance, we need to talk about energy and effort. What's the extent co-production? So we know that it's going to cost us $150 to register, eight hours to attend, and two weeks of limping, plus six months of training and preparation. It is a marathon literally a marathon, we're selling you tickets to go into an expensive marathon where you have to run for ages, be in pain for an extended period for it, and train and prepare to use a service. What are the psychological risks and social risks attached to this as well? What are the, using a service, what are the social risks? What do people think of you? And now I'm gonna assume that there is that nightclub, everyone has a nightclub, in mind when I say is that nightclub that if you go to you know your friends are going to look at you and go seriously really because there's a social cost and you might like it you might say yeah whatever or it might be the reason that you stop going is because your friends are judging you for it frankly if your friends are judging you get better friends
Also, if you're judging your friends for them enjoying themselves doing something, you've got to really consider what it is you do with your life. There are much better reasons to judge people, okay? The psychological risk element is the... If you think about it from the point of view of how much control do you get to exert, to what extent do you need to exert control, and again, think back to that types of service. A search attribute dominant service has lower psychological risk because you're aware of more of the parts. You're under, you understand more of what's going on. Experiential has a psychological risk of, I, uh, am I really enjoying this to the best of my capacity? Type of, uh, I'm not sure about this. And credence products are top of the psychological risk because you have no idea what's going on and if it's any good. So tally all that up, and that's the cost. Money, time, for time and effort foregone, so opportunity cost. Functional, does it do what you want it to do? And then subtract that from the value. What are people going to get out of the service? If there's a positive result at the end, brilliant, welcome, congratulations, you're on, and you should be profitable, and you can charge for it. Lastly, the third part of this was the influence of competition. Now, some of you should have that little alarm bell going in your head going, hang on, I already said competition services was difficult because, well, Credence products. Competition gives people a chance to judge your pricing. It's really important to understand how that judging works though, is that you can Use competition to your advantage. You can position yourself as perceived to be better because we're more expensive. Well, you could go to the cheaper alternative. Position yourself as better value for your money. You can't get ripped off if you go to the more expensive one. Or position yourself on other facets, friendliness, unfriendliness. So you've got the non-price related costs that the competition can also be, you can block competition because the risk of change. Yes, there are multiple competitors in this market, but I always go here because it's, it's safe. Yeah, it could be better somewhere else, but it's okay here. So you've got to think about inertia as a kind of discounting function. Yeah, it's going to get inexpensive to keep coming back to this one place, and none of us are really 100% enjoying it anymore, but man, the search costs of finding something new are going to be too high. The other elements you've got in terms of fending off competition, personal relationships with firms create barriers to exit. And we're going to talk a little bit about barriers and rate fences and other elements here. Switching costs, time, money, and effort to change. If you are encouraging people to change, you need to give them trial so that they can do low risk assessments. And you also have this very specific distribution challenges. Now, competition, you might actually have a successful barrier to competition because you're the only operator in the zone. At three o'clock in the morning, if you've got the food truck and you are the pizza platform within staggering distance of the nightclub that just closed with the 3 a.m. lockout law, you've got the market opportunity because you've got the location. But if you are several staggers away past the pizza place, you've got the location challenge because your competitor is better located. So look over the how what competition can do in terms of your pricing. But remember, the role of competition is not to drive down your price. Just because you have a competitor doesn't mean you have to price lower than them. What the competitor does is gives you an opportunity to use positioning and to use your integrated marketing communications, to use your strategy, to use your segmentation and your targeting to create positioning based on being like them but different or not like them and better, not like them and better because we're more expensive. So don't always assume competition means cheaper. Competition can mean opportunities to go large, more expensive and differentiate because you've got someone else to contrast against. And that way, that contrasting experience helps solidify the service concept in the mind of the user. 
All right. Talking here now, got a couple of things. Uh, revenue, yield management. Basically, got a couple of highlight points here, the table and the connected text around this. Effectively, this is, as a theoretical area, a conceptual area, getting you to look at how to combine the price idea and a series of other theories and ideas. So if we just take the top line. Yield management is about selling the right infantry unit. That's price and product combined. So that's two theory areas. What is supported? What makes it the right unit? Service quality, customer satisfaction, maybe even customization, service design. To the right customer. Now we've got segmentation. Now we've, what are the other elements there? Well, the, the right customer. How do we know they're the right customer? Willingness to pay. At the right time, suddenly distribution's back in place. At the right price, this chapter. But also as part of the right price is the strategy, the positioning, the segmentation, the IMC that lets you set up value-based pricing or price discriminations or competitive pricing. So this section is early, you know, we're only at chapter six, but we're trying to integrate the ideas already. So I want you to pay attention, make notes as to how these ideas overlap and interplay. It will help when you do things like literature reviews, you're looking for interplay and interconnection between ideas. So it's a good chance to train here. So the other element about yield management is that you are trying to deal with the curse of perishability. Once a service has been created, or once the service, the time has passed that the service could be used, the service is gone. So you are looking at, also when we're again pushing you back to the textbook to look at this, you are looking at something that is context specific. So this yield management works in certain conditions, so it's not a universal theory. Again. Segmentation, the principle, philosophy, theory, and idea of dividing up, of not regarding one thing as universal, of not regarding there being a single solution to everything, applies to our thinking as marketers and to our practice as marketers. So you want to be aware that you can't use every theory every time. You can't use all of the theories and not all theories are applicable to all service options. Again, pushing you to do the co-create thing here. Look at these conditions. Look at how these conditions work. Look at the cases around you. How and where are these conditions prevalent and present? How are these elements being used? All right, differential pricing strategies. Yes, segmentation gets a huge run in pricing. And segmentation is absolutely vital because you can segment on a variable which is willingness to pay and a variable capacity to pay. I'm willing to pay $10,000 for this. I don't have $10,000, but if I did, I'd be willing to. Versus, I can afford 50, I will afford 50. Therefore, selling me something at $60 won't get my attention. Selling me something at $25 will make me worry about how good the quality is. Selling something at 40 to 49.99 will make me think, yep, in the zone. So we're going to talk a little bit about the, the rate uh, fencing here, just to give you an idea of how to use the segmentation concepts and differential pricing and make it fit to what you're trying to achieve. So we take the idea of the physical. In a service, we have service scape, and we also have services that are supported by fiscal goods. So what you can do in just your supported service is you can change the price to support the action or uh, the different types of rates. So if you go to a car rental site, so you go hit up Hertz, Avis, rent a car, you'll see the type and size of the physical product you're borrowing for a fee 
So the basic product rate fence is on the physical goods. You pay $31, you get the small car. You pay $158, you get the big pretty fancy one. And if you've got my luck, you pay 30 bucks and you get that awful tank thing that they upgraded you to for the fun of it. You also then have physical add-ons. You can do extended parts of the service flower. So you can bring in additional component parts, say maybe in hospitality or in one of the other facets where you provide a physical object. In this case, the examples are breakfast. But you can also provide artifacts, emblems, symbols, little lapel badges, cards, artifacts that say you were here that are better when you're paying a higher rate than they were. So if you go to the hotel room, you pay the slightly extra premium, you get the slightly nicer shampoo and conditioner. If you pay the base product, you get the empty sink and the towel. You pay the really expensive, you get the really nice towels and a complimentary take home bathrobe. Adding on little physical tangible traits to distinguish the different types of rates that you're paying. Adding on a couple of the other, let's go to the non-physical sides here. This is again inside the service flower. You're thinking about what can we do about modifying the way the transaction, the consumption, or the nature of the consumer. So for transactions, we've got things like flexibility, uh, we've got use times, we've got the ability to modify. So if you buy in advance, you get a discount. We've got things like the ability to go and say that there will be a cheaper rate for a different time. And we mentioned that in terms of rate fencing, offering, using pricing to alter, in fact, if we uh, just briefly bring back up an old, older slide, the rate fencing can work in things like the building a user base, non-monetary pricing, and to maximize demand. So you've got capacity, again, an interlink of the ideas. You want to build demand, you want to maximize capacity, so that you'll bring about this rate fence approach where if you're willing to go late and risk missing out for a slightly cheaper price, we'll let you have tickets within you know, last minute tickets or flip it around the other way of last minute tickets greatly extended because we know you've got the demand and the need. So again, what we're looking at here is the capacity to modify the service and modify demand on the service with price. Lastly is picking your rate fence around your customer and your customer's characteristics. Again, services is so heavily dependent on segmentation because services is dependent on the experience of the person. And you see here things like group membership. Group membership ties back to these other objectives that we were talking about, like equity. Size of the customer group. If you know that you can bulk sell and you get 20 people, you've got capacity for 20 and you can sell a group of 20, it's worth knocking the edges off the price so that they will come in as a single combined co-producing unit. If you've got 20 people who all know each other, you've got an automatic audience that is starting to gain benefit from collaborative co-production. Okay, nearing to the last couple of things that we need to address here, this is just a reminder that in terms of price, and these links are live in the, uh, the PowerPoint, you need to value your work. And this is for those of you who are going to go off and have personal skills based services, and that is art, that is consultancy, and that is writing, and that is working for hire. You need to ensure you cover your costs. You need to ensure that you value your work. And if your price that you are trying to charge is not going to be accepted by that market, you might be targeting the wrong market. So ensure that you're covering your costs. Never, never price for exposure. Never work for exposure. 
don't do it. It's just not there, it doesn't work, and it's an unethical. If you ask someone to work for exposure, you are unethical and immoral, and you are a thieving, stealing, disrespectful, non-marketer who doesn't understand the value of a product. And I get much, much, much harsher than that. Don't give away when you can charge because you should be charging because the value of free is not perceived as high quality. If you've got to pay for it, it's worth more than if it's being given away for free. So think about it for your pricing, think about it for your skill set, and if your market won't buy it, change markets. All right, the ethics, and that was uh, ethics and pricing. Look, top of the lists, services is implied quality from prices. We don't have a lot of things to judge services on in advance. Price is one of them. Be ethical in your pricing. So services are inherently com complicated. Services are particularly credence services. Do not, and I'm calling you on this, you're the new generation. You have the choice to be better and be better than the older generations who have come before you and been a pack of douche canoes about hiding fees, sneaking in extra charges, using complicated, confusing contracts to suddenly hit people with penalties where even lawyers can't find how it, that could have possibly been explained and brought to the attention of the customer whilst they were trying to sign a 35-page end-user license agreement. Hey, Apple. Don't do it. All right. If your product sucks so much that you have to lie, cheat, and steal and be unethical in your pricing, it's room full of mirrors time. Take a good hard look at yourself and say, why am I producing something so bad I have to be corrupt and unethical to charge a working rate for it? So fix that up. All right, the cheerful close out. The last thing we want to do, I want to draw your attention to table 6.6. .6. It's a good series of checklist questions. It's one of these ones that for you personally, if you take nothing away from this course other than this, take table 6.6, .6, get a copy of it, save these slides somewhere, ensure that you walk away being able to work out how much am I going to charge for my services what should my decisions be based on? How much? What's the basis of the pricing? Who's collecting the payment? So who's responsible for actually asking for the money? Where's the payment made? When is it made? Is it made in advance? Is it made after the service? How is it made? And there's a lot of options. And how are you going to tell the market about your price? What's your mechanism? And how are you going to explain your price? Are you going to explain it as a cognitive, emotive, or a cognitive, uh, say, a rational or irrational? So you're going to sell it as a, look at the value, here's the price breakdown, or because you're worth it type of price. So, as always, if you need me, there's your connections. Get in touch. Your tasks, the standard issue, follow through on the readings, read the chapter, take the notes. But also, what I want you to start thinking is, what's it cost you to do this subject? What's the hourly rate? And what's your ROI on your studying? I'm serious about that. Because for some of you, it might actually be cheaper to not study. Now, for most of you, it's not. But also, if you start thinking about this from the point of view of, Okay, it's going to cost me $40, say, hypothetically, it'll cost you $40 an hour to, you know, if you don't study, or if you spread the studying out, oh, it's 12 bucks an hour. So start working out, what's your, what's your price, what are your costs, what are your total costs involved in studying? Start getting some of these costing frameworks on things you are aware of, like your own life. As always, if you need me, there's a connections, and I try not to think about the cost of what it costs to actually record these things, but... Suffice to say, I'm glad I didn't have to buy the building.